Dr. Ramsey Ramalways is a critical care and infectious disease physician uh, based mostly at Midtown and as Grady as well. who will be speaking to us today about diagnosis and management of drug allergies. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to be talking, my name is Ramsey Ramawi. I'm an assistant professor of medicine for the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care here. Um, I'm going to be talking about the diagnosis and management of drug allergies. The reason I chose to talk about this is because not only are there newer things in regards to how to diagnose somebody with the, with the allergic reaction, but often there's some confusion in the ICU when a patient is having an allergic reaction. Whether or not that's a worsening of their condition or an actual allergy, sometimes there's some questions and some confusion there. And so I thought maybe giving a talk on that would help strengthen that and make you more confident when making the diagnosis of a drug allergy. In order to do that, we have to have a similar foundation of what exactly are some common terminologies when talking about drug allergies. Not every um, uh, drug uh, uh, adverse reaction is an allergic reaction, but every allergic reaction from a drug is an adverse drug reaction. So a drug reaction can, uh, an adverse drug reaction can either be predictable and, or unpredictable, um, and it does not include uh, therapeutic failures, overdoses, uh, or drug abuse. A drug allergy, on the other hand, is an immunological response uh, to either a pharmaceutical agent or, or a formulation. What, in fact, is tolerance induction? Well, this is the art of desensitization, and it can be either IgE-mediated or non-IgE-mediated re mediated reaction, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, we classically know this when we're dealing with either penicillin allergic patients or aspirin allergic patients. Uh, when those patients need those drugs, uh, we desensitize them. And so that is a drug, uh, a toler tolerance induction. Anaphylaxis, if, uh, if everyone here were to grab a textbook and look up the definition of anaphylaxis, probably every textbook would give a different, uh, different definition. There is no set term to the term anaphylaxis. Um, however, it does encompass all of the IgE-mediated responses. And so for the most part, most people think of anaphylaxis as life-threatening. And so hypotension, bronchospasm. But if you look at some textbooks, some textbooks will define anaphylaxis as simply nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea after a drug reaction, after getting the med medication. And so um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to define anaphylaxis as life-threatening hypotension. But keep in mind that not every definition for anaphylaxis is the same. Um, Pseudo-allergic reaction, that's your um, um, uh, anaphylactoid reaction, which is a non-IgE-mediated response uh, that similarly mimics anaphylaxis. And then finally, drug idiosyncrasy. Well, this is the caveat. I mean, this is the, the clench here is the fact that it's reproducible. And uh, I know Dr. Hunt is going to be talking to you about drug fever. But something I find in the infectious disease world in patients with drug fever is we commonly know patients who have uh, fevers are tachycardic. But in patients who have drug fevers, I commonly find that if a patient is um, having a normal heart rate with a high fever, uh, that's a ca uh, common thing to make you think about uh, drug fever. Obviously, if the patient is not receiving some kind of beta blockade or, or, uh, or, or a heart affecting medication, um, it's not really written that much, but I find it in any way, drug idiosyncrasy is a reproducible and unexpected effect. So what exactly is a type 1 reaction? Type 1 reaction is an IgE-mediated response. And this is different from your type 2, type 3, and type 4 reaction. Type 2 reaction involves the cells IgM and IgG. Uh, so what happens there is it binds to the IgG-IgM and causes a red blood cell lysis. A common example of that is your autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Type 3 reaction, uh, this is only IgG causing an immune complex reaction, and a common example of that is lupus. And then type 4 involves just a T cell. The T cell is uh, um, activated by the allergen, and that causes a delayed type reaction, like a contact dermatitis, like a rash. Again, rash is not a type 1 reaction. A rash is not an IgE-mediated reaction. And, uh, your IgE-mediated reactions, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide, are your, uh, response, uh, are your responses for a classic allergy and the common terminology as, as anaphylaxis. So this is, the cav this is the common puzzle we come in here. Say, for example, we have a patient who comes into the ICU with a healthcare-associated pneumonia. You go ahead and start them on vanc vancomycin and piperacillin and azobactam. After 30 minutes, their blood pressure drops, and now you're thinking, oh, wow, their sepsis is getting worse, and I have to start them on pressors. However, you do not think that maybe the patient is having an allergic response to the medications that you give them, where the appropriate response would be to go ahead and stop that drug. We're thinking that this is sepsis, and we're continuing that drug. And so that's where the trouble is here. If all you have is hypotension, it's hard to know sometimes that the patient is having an allergic response. And so 
That's why sometimes we have to look for some of the other things that comes with an IgE-mediated type of response. The patient can have bronchospasm and wheezing, require intubation, some upper extremity edema. You can even see that angioedema uh, is common, like this child. This is a child that I saw uh, who developed a penicillin allergic response and clearly and, uh, uh, puffiness around the eyes. Uh, he did not have puffiness around the, uh, I'm sorry, edema around the airway requiring intubation. They can have GI manifestations such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Central nervous system manifestations, they can be confused, have a headache, and this is often within a couple minutes. You give the drug and then the patient says, look, I'm having a really bad headache, and after a couple minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes later, they might even syncopize. You should be really thinking, okay, this patient might be allergic to this drug. And then the, the real kicker is the skin manifestations. They can have this classic wheel and flare. Here's the wheel surrounded by the flare. This is a patient who'd received cefazolin and uh, developed a wheel and flare response. And then this is what I'll be talking about, this uh, penicillin skin testing. Patients who received either the major or the minor determinant and classically has that wheel and flare surrounded by edema. These are the skin manifestations, which really make it a little bit easier for us to make the diagnosis, but they don't have to have the skin manifestations. They only have to have one of all of these. So keep in mind, when you start a drug and the patient is developing worsening hypotension, that the patient might in fact just be allergic to the drug and not having a worsening of their primary disorder. What are some risk factors? Are there more patients who are predisposed to allergic reactions? And the answer is yes. Females have a higher predisposition, almost three to one, of having uh, an allergic response uh, to, uh, to a medication. Uh, obese patients, and this is sometimes harder to notice in patients with, for example, obese patients with substantial uh, uh, um, a nigra on the back, sometimes that skin discoloration might not help you see um, a rash there. Uh, age over 60 and then obviously an immune, immune dysregulation is going to cause a patient to have an IgE-mediated response a little bit more. But the clinical clue is the fact that you give it and it should not take long. Most patients, if they're going to get an allergic reaction, it's going to happen within 5, 10, 15 minutes. If it's happening a day later, it's usually not an IgE-mediated response. This is something that's going to happen within the first 30 minutes. This is a study that I did at the pri uh, prior institution where I worked where we took a history of patients who only said that they have IgE-mediated responses. and We wanted to see what is the most common of the IgE-mediated responses. If I were to take a toll of patients who are allergic to, for example, penicillin in this room, most of the people who say that they're allergic are going to say, I don't remember. It happened 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. But the patients who do remember an IgE-mediated response, the most common of them are going to be patients who develop hives. They, were, they develop skin manifestations. Not many patients uh, are going to say, my blood pressure dropped. The patients don't typically um, have that. It's not as common. But the more common of them that you should be looking for are the hives and the urticaria. Where exactly are, I, are allergy responses most common? Well, obviously the most common is going to be in a pharmacy. A patient goes, they pick up the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole at the pharmacy, they take their first, first dose while w walking out, and then they either syncopize or they develop a rash. That's in the pharmacy. But that's not what we're going to see. We're going to see up here in the medical and surgical ICU, which is still a common area for us to be uh, seeing these allergic responses. And so we have to keep it in, our, in the back of our head because it is actually that common. What are some medications? I think most of us will say that beta-lactams are probably the most common. But you'll actually know that there was a recent paper that was reported that showed that morphine is actually the most common cause, more common than beta-lactams, to cause an IgE-mediated type of response. And so it might not always be an antibiotic, but if it is an antibiotic, beta-lactams stand as the forefront, followed by sulfa and quinolones. A patient can just receive Tylenol and develop an allergic response. You might be thinking, okay, I'm treating this fever with Tylenol, and then that Tylenol can actually be causing an allergic response. Um, aspirin, chemotherapy drugs, uh, rituximab is a big cause there. Antiretrovirals, for example, nevirapine, um, is a common cause where the patient might have increase in their LFTs and uh, an allergic response. Uh, abacavir, um, we have to uh, send off a test prior to giving uh, the drug abacavir because there is such a high predisposition towards a life-threatening immune response. Patients who are diabetics, insulin can cause an allergic response, uh, anti-epileptic drugs, and then your non-depolarizing, of which succinylcholine is the highest there to be causing an IgE-mediated type of response. This was that paper I was talking about, morphine, higher than any of the beta-lactams or any other, other drugs. You think that you're treating the patient's pain and the patient develops hypotension, and you might think that that is the morphine that's doing that, but in fact, it might be an allergic response that's happening every time you're giving it. Um, 
These are the other drugs I was talking about, um, of which beta-lactams were the most common. So this is uh, another um, study that we did where we wanted to see, okay, if there is an antibiotic, what antibiotic is the most common? And I think here we've proven, I think the literature also shows this, that beta-lactams, of which penicillin is the most common, um, and it usually happens uh, in patients who got it when they were a child, because penicillin at that point, prior to 15 years ago, penicillin was often mixed with some type of anesthetic so that the shot doesn't hurt as much when the child has strep throat or whatnot. And so that child might have been allergic to some of the uh, compound medications that were given with that penicillin and might not actually be allergic to the penicillin, but they will always, for the rest of their life, carry that label of I am penicillin allergic. Keep in mind that sulfa is a very close second. Patients who are allergic to sulfa are not restricted from that many antibiotics as patients who are, resist who are reporting resistance to penicillins. How exactly, now the fact that I said penicillin is the most common, I'm going to talk about some things we could do to diagnose a penicillin allergy. For example, you go ahead and start piperacillin tazobactam or you start just penicillin for a patient with, for example, group B strep. And, uh, and the patient develops a response and you say in the back of your head, maybe this is an allergic response. I, I want to diagnose this. And so we probably know that in the textbooks you could send off a RAST. The only problem with RAST is that it only detects major determinants. Major determinant, the most common of them being benzyl penicill oil. It doesn't diagnose minor determinants. There are some penicillin minor determinants like penicillin G, for example, that we're giving. It won't diagnose that. Then there's an, uh, some uh, cast is another thing you could do, uh, but that's not very efficacious for IgE media response. I'm going to spend the next slide talking about skin prick testing uh, because I spent a lot of time in doing that, um, and uh, it's only available for, for penicillin. We don't have a, a skin prick test for sulfur or quinolones um, uh, or aminoglycosides for that matter. And then serum tryptase here at Emory University, we don't have the serum tryptase test. It's a, it's a great test when you have it. If a patient has allergic response, you go ahead and you send it. You have to send it within six hours. If the level is above 20, for example, that usually clinches your diagnosis, and then you resend it after six hours, and that level should normalize. That helps you make the diagnosis of an allergy. Uh, but unfortunately, um, not every institution has that test to be drawn. So this is an example of a skin test. We're going to get this at Emory University. We're going to be starting with it at Emory University Midtown. How exactly do you do it? You have your major and minor determinant. You're going to just drop your major and minor onto the skin. You wait 15 minutes. This is an example of a negative uh, reaction. Um, and then if the patient doesn't have a reaction, you go ahead and you inject it under the skin. And then after 15 minutes, if the patient doesn't have a reaction that has a uh, sensitivity and specificity of 99%, you can go ahead and take it off their chart that the patient is no longer or probably never was penicillin allergic and safely give a penicillin agent. This is an example of a patient who did have a response. Um, we did a study where we tested 3,000 patients um, at a facility in North Carolina, and we found that 2,999 of them actually did not have a penicillin allergy. This was the only patient who actually did, and, um, and it made me think in the back of my head, maybe it's not as common, um, but you still have to worry about it. This is him developing edema under the arms. He, start, he said it started to itch, and usually it's the same reaction they had when they were a child, they said, look, when I got a medication, it started to itch on my chest and my arms. And then I got the medication, and now you're skin testing them, it's going to have the same reaction. So you can kind of uh, gauge what you're looking for based on the history, if in fact they remember it. Although it's not that um, um, pertinent to my study, where are we giving beta-lactams? We're usually giving them for pneumonia, urinary tract infections, intra-abdominal infections, and skin infections. And if a patient is reporting a beta-lactam allergy, this is what we're often doing. We're often going to quinolones, astreonam, clindamycin, depending on where the infection is. And we found that when we're able to actually do this skin test and diagnose a true um, allergic response, we're able to go to more comforting agents, which we're more comfortable and more um, commonly giving, for example, piptazo. Uh, or ceftriaxone or cefepime. And so um, this skin testing is probably more accurate and more easy to do and a lot faster than desensitization. And so it's something that you might want to keep in mind when doing it. This is, uh, uh, I find that many times in an ICU when we are dealing with an allergic response, say for example, it's a patient who just has itchiness 
and uh, you gave the drug. A lot of people will feel comfortable just giving steroids and maybe Benadryl and thinking that alone should treat that anaphylaxis. But usually, uh, remember that it causes a cascade of events. The patient might start with itching, and then after about 15, 20 minutes, the patient will become hypotensive, syncopized, might develop in respiratory failure. And so you, don't, you wanna be ahead of that ball. I think giving just Benadryl and steroids is not enough, and so that's why the guidelines recommends epinephrine. If you're giving the drug and the patient is developing any kind of response that's making you think that this is an allergic response, in the back of your mind, you should be going right to epinephrine, not Benadryl and steroids. And so um, you should always discontinue the drug. If you think it's the allergy, it causing an allergy, establish IV access, put the patient in the supine position, things to elevate the blood pressure. Obviously, if the patient is developing airway obstruction, nebulized epinephrine is given there or the patient might need to be intubated. Bronchospasms, then the bronchodilators are given. If the patient is hypotensive, then uh, a crystalloid bolus obviously would be uh, the first line there. If the patient is not responding the way you want them to, well then you can continue to give epinephrine every three to five minutes. Remember the dosage here. It's not the same dosage as you're giving um, uh, for other types of uh, um, uh, things in the ICU, for example, cardio uh, cardio cardiac resuscitation, you would not give one over 1,000. This is an anaphylaxis reaction, so you're gonna give it a much different dose, one over 1,000 rather than one over 10,000. Every three to five minutes, and still, if you're not getting the response that you want, or if you wanna go right to a drip, if the patient continues to be hypotensive, then epinephrine would be your drip of choice there. Um, you can give repeated crystalloid boluses. If the patient is bradycardic, atropine can be given there, and then if you think it's because of a beta blocker, then glucagon can be given to reverse that. And so I think with that, I'll close and just kind of wanted to keep it in the back of your mind that allergy is not that uncommon. And we got to keep it in the back of our minds because we're commonly thinking when the patient is crumping, it's crumping because of either sepsis or their primary disorder, but they can be crumping because of the medication that we're giving them. And I think with that, I'll close and open the doors for questions.